It could be argued that the council and or its senior officers deliberately chose to ignore updating the five-year rolling forward replacement unitary development plan as a means of using it as a diversionary smokescreen in order to secure S106 funding from these and other greenfield developments within Bradford before January 2015. And we'll come back to that a little bit later on. It has to be mentioned that there were some local residents in the Simpson Green area who felt that their local councillor, Jeanette Sunderland, had been committing far more time and effort towards ensuring the Coke Farm development didn't go ahead than that of Simpson Green. And this was based on the fact that her home is sited on the edge of the proposed Coke Farm development and overlooks the green fields. Green fields that would soon be turned into another large housing estate. These underlying feelings of suspicion weren't calmed by the fact that just two days before the Regulatory and Appeals Committee, due to be held on the 4th of September 2014, Liberal Democrat MP David Ward wrote a three-page call-in letter specific to Cope Farm to the Secretary of State Eric Pickles. The very same Eric Pickles who had had the local council 2% tax levy ceiling inserted into the Queen's speech. However, given their shared local similarities and equally strong arguments against both developments, at the time one could have viewed any suspicions as mild paranoia. But then again, other strange things were happening just before the dual appeals. It suddenly became increasingly difficult to access and navigate the council's website portal a situation which Councillor Sunderland would later describe at a public meeting as But no, it just all got tangled up in one big long mess, which meant that some people were spending a lot of time trying to find documents and I certainly struggled like mad to find things if I, if I didn't copy them off and save them. It was just impossible and it all felt like somebody was trying to stop us. Then came the day of both appeals. Court Farm would be the first to be heard, and news of this calling letter to Eric Pickles was now being mentioned amongst attending objectors, and the consensus was that it would be unlikely for the Appeals Committee to find in favour of the developer. Now at the time, I didn't quite understand why this should influence an Appeals Committee, particularly one with a Labour majority, but if true, then it seemed reasonable to assume that the Simpson Green appeal would also go against the developer. Let's very quickly explain what we're looking at here. This is Councillor David Warburton. He's chairing the appeal. Next to him, on our left, is a chap from the city's legal department. To the right of him is the clerk from the secretariat who's there to record the minutes of the appeal. Down here, we have representatives from the city's planning and highways department who will outline the case for the development as well as put forward any explanations relating to assessment and impact reports. And here, we have the appeals committee who, after hearing and querying all the evidence and statements from all concerned parties, shall give their decision either for or against the development. Now it should be stated that whilst there is no time limit set for the representatives of the highways and planning department presenting the case, there is a five minute time limit for any individual voicing an objection or representing the developer. In fact, the Court Farm appeal took nearly three hours to conclude, but for this purpose I shall only show some of the relevant parts as well as highlighting some of the procedural inconsistencies which took place during this hearing. So let's get started. Public and is not a public meeting, 
The attendance of the public to observe the proceedings is welcome, but participation is limited to those individuals that the chair has agreed can address the committee in accordance with the usual procedures. Anyone uh, hasn't spoken to our officers for the name down? Can you please indicate and then uh, we can make sure that you're added to the list? Okay. In considering the applications before us, there is no place for party politics. That has been confirmed by case law. Councillors present act as individuals not bound by any party label or any pressure from any political group. Members of the committee or panel should not be approached or pass any kind of note by any attendees. It is not possible to table any additional documents at the meeting unless it be free organised. Okay. Members and officers present at the meeting will now have already introduced themselves, so we will now go on to the business items. The first item, item 5, membership of subcommittees. I've not received any recommendations. Okay. So the next item is item 6, land profile, nature and staff level. I'll hand over to Mr. Craig for a presentation. Thank you. The extract in this next section follows a very lengthy explanation of the S106 funding in relation to the monies being used for the Greengate's traffic lights and local educational needs possibly being delayed. However, a basic procedural issue is brought into play by Councillor Whiteley. What that then allows for is subsequent schemes that would come forward would obviously not have to make a single contribution to the new line because that scheme would be packaged up and would be paid for by the first year. That would allow them, from a liability point of view, to have a clear run to all of the other contributions such as the Fund of Education without having to pay us and that program. And thank you for your answer. We're really looking to see that kind of education because there's absolutely no mention of it in this report. Councillor Whiteley pointed out that none of what was being explained was included in their documentation pack. Moments later, a five-page document was distributed amongst committee members, resulting in a five-minute recess for them to digest its contents. This information could be crucial to those opposing the application, a situation which this opening statement by the chair is designed to avoid. Members of the committee or panel should not be approached or pass any kind of note by any attendees. It is not possible to table any additional documents at the meeting unless it be free organised. Okay? Members and officers present at the meeting. Then came the moment for David Ward MP to make his five minute statement of objection to the committee. Let's hear in full what he had to say and then witness the reaction by committee member, Councillor Lee. Press yeah, thank you. News is, uh, is my day. Um, as you know, uh, Chair, I've been around quite a long time and bring some memories uh, to this up uh, and what's happened in the past. So I do find it really quite bizarre uh, to be assisting a planning application at the same time a road route from two miles away. And that, that being seen as being a significant contribution to, to the debate. That was seen odd. I do know I attended a meeting in 1985 at the Old Green Rate Primary School about uh, that communication, and I do know about the problems there. But it does seem uh, it's actually not fraud, and I can understand why it isn't, to take a contribution from one area and to make that money available to address the problem in another area. Uh, it certainly seems somewhat immoral and distorts, in my view, what should be a rational, logical argument about the contribution required from a particular development to the impact of that development on its own locality and also to manipulate, which seems to be the case, the social housing contribution as a way of balancing the books in some way, again, seems to be somewhat immoral. I want to talk really about the original um, development of this site because um, it's maybe not it's unfortunate for the officers, but I do remember what council officers were saying to us when we, the produce of those who live on Coke Farm, we tried to stop the whole of the development that took place there unsuccessfully. The council itself designated this land as urban green space. We opposed the whole of the development, but the council itself stated that this land was crucially important. The words that we used in the council's own report were green lawn. The council itself, not us, 
It referred to it as a crucially important buffer between Windle and Fatland. An important contribution to keeping some part of the um, south facing side of the Air Valley so that it wasn't continuously done. It was a strong opinion that it made a, a very important contribution to the residents of Bailey. It's not mentioned in this report, but the council itself used these as arguments for not developing the whole of the side and retaining this piece of land. The council itself made these arguments which it doesn't seem now to support. We're told that the basis of going against the policy is the housing deficit, deficit really, the shortage of housing land. But surely this is just premature. Now it may be that when that five year uh, housing supply is finally determined, it may well be that the, this piece of land is redesignated as housing land. I hope it isn't, but it may be. But surely that should be a, through a, a rigorous consultation process and also seen against the other proposals for the use of land across the district. That's how this piece of land should be changed, if it is to be changed, from urban green space to housing land, not through the distortion and manipulation of uh, Section 106 funding because it's convenient to form a development two miles away. In terms of the traffic just going back to that, I have to say that the officer said there's no impact on the local community. Well, it wasn't the case this morning when I was on the road from Fatley uh, to uh, Windhill this morning at 8 o'clock. But also the council themselves put in a Section 106 agreement when that development was originally built for traffic lights at Fatley Donna. So at that time, the council did not proceed with that on the basis of the flow of traffic, but it was a requirement agreed by the developer at the time of the Coke Farm development that there should be traffic lights because it recognised it would be an impact on traffic. And yet now, we have council officers saying not only that development, but this additional development will not have an impact on local traffic. To note, just to notify the uh, committee members, I have asked the Secretary of State to call in this decision. I had a brief meeting with the Secretary of State yesterday, who's going to the Housing Minister, and uh, I'm doing that on the basis of the um, fact that this is, in my view, premature, and I've said that reference to the National Planning Policy Framework, uh, rather than to local plans, is premature and removes the opportunity for local people consulted on the future of the site in the development plan document allocations. That will be, that should be, the right time to consider the future use of this land and not through the charade which is going on uh, in this present uh, meeting. This outburst by Councillor Lee was not only very concerning, it was revealing in terms of what she was or wasn't taking into consideration with those matters attached to the S106 funds. But this was a very clear demonstration of political division, an attack towards a member of an opposing party who is currently part of a coalition government, something she also refers to later. It could be seen as David Ward's reference to the call-in letter to the Secretary of State acted as a sort of political red rag to a bull. And again, I would refer to the Chair's opening statements, which are intended to avoid such incidents. In considering the applications before us, there is no place for party politics. That has been confirmed by case law. Councillors present act as individuals, not party. 
background by any bouncer label or any pressure from any political group. After nearly three hours, it was now time for the committee panel to arrive at their decision in relation to the Cork Farm development, and here it is. I'm concerned with the effect on local provision, and I thank you very much for circulating the report that was missing from the main papers. From it, you can see that um, school places are oversubscribed in each and every school. I have a problem with a lack of joint of thinking. Given that there are no plans, or indeed finance, to build new schools, I think what we should have had a report which told us whether it was feasible to build onto existing schools to meet the demand. This is a vital bit of information that's missing, and I think we, you know, we should have had that information. Also, if it was possible, I don't know, to, to extend the existing schools, the 106 education contribution is much less, much less than it would normally be required to meet the cost of providing these additional places. And whilst it, we may be able to rely on the new homes bonus, there's no guarantee that the houses will be built in the three years that it's still available. So I think on that basis, you know, we're talking about real people on their lives and their ability to educate their children. I think this is socially unsustainable and I will not be supporting it.
very grateful, Chair. I won't support you down on highway scrambles. Thank you. The committee panel, having unanimously voted to reject the Coke Farm application, now need to clearly outline their reasons for doing so. What takes place has to be unprecedented, even by the person's own admission, and could actually be seen as a case of forethought of intention. Now I don't know if you noticed, but it seemed as though the city's legal representative had included additional elements attached to conservation. He also stated one of the main reasons for the refusal was a loss of green space. Not true. Only Councillor Sykes refused the application on those grounds. Perhaps the city's legal representative was in fact referring to David Ward's argument and the call-in letter he sent to the Secretary of State, which mainly focused on the green space issue. Also, during Councillor Lee's decision, the Chair had to caution her, as even he had concerns as to what she was saying about the process and the political coalition. Immediately after the Coke Farm appeal, there was a break for lunch, before the Simpson Green appeal was to be heard. Naturally, expectations were high amongst the Simpson Green camp. After all, same road, same traffic problems, same schools and same green space issue. And as the same committee panel was hearing the appeal, what could possibly alter a similar outcome? The case for the Simpson Green development was being put forward by Fiona Tiplady and Councillor Wainwright was no longer part of the committee panel not a real problem as the committee was still correct. The appeal seemed to be travelling at a pace. Issues appeared to be hurriedly covered and some were omitted completely. Even the questions posed by some of the committee panel, particularly the Labour members, seemed lethargic. But then given that the Coke Farm appeal had taken an unusual amount of time and that the committee panel were already aware of the main thrust of the issues and arguments, it could be viewed as being reasonable. However, this appeal seemed very different from the Court Farm appeal. So let's now move directly to the committee panel's decisions. Yes, uh, I, I don't have issues with the flats. I mean, it's, it's absolutely well known in this area that the flats are not to sell, but uh, I hope the developer will find out to his cost. Highways, I have to say, I cannot quite find the same problem with this development as I did the last. Because the whole of my ward to the north is served by central bridges across the canal, and that's over a thousand dances. And I've lived there 30 years, and we have not had a major disaster. So, with that in mind, I would recommend approval of this. Okay. I hope at this stage, you, the viewer, 
are as confused as I am. What is this woman babbling on about? Well, it would appear she has suddenly decided to ignore the primary reasons for the panel's previous decisions to refuse the Court Farm development. Increased traffic, lack of school places, loss of green space, conservation, etc. And instead, concentrate on the secondary issues specific to Simpson Green, but ones that would have an even higher detrimental impact on traffic and conservation. Let me explain. Miller Homes plans included the proposed development of a series of four-storey high duplex luxury apartments that would overlook the scenic Dobson's Lock. In order to preserve the natural and aesthetic beauty of this area, English Heritage lodged their own objections to the proposals. As for the Canal Bridge Council Lee is referring to, well, that's situated down here on Appley Lane, a road constantly used to negate the traffic lights at Greengate Crossing, and is often referred to as a rat run. The canal bridge itself is only wide enough to accommodate a single line of traffic, with no facilities for pedestrians to cross safely. Now, the additional traffic issues here are 1. The new development of 270 houses only has access via Appley Lane, a road one could argue isn't suitable for such an increasing traffic flow without significant alterations. Two. This substantial increase in traffic as a result of the additional 270 houses can only serve to exacerbate traffic congestion on Appley Lane and the A657 and A658. Let's now return to the rest of the committee panel's decisions. Some concerns, I think, with the uh, flats or apartments, 
the overall design for me um, brings this context into housing that we need. Um, a major dearth of housing across the districts, a major dearth of housing in the north and in this area. And for me, this would be a proposal that we go forward. Um, we have um, a proposal. Do we have a second? Okay, we've seconded. So now we go to the votes and those in favour. 